Vandaag bij Antwoorden met Belis Conley. And we need to put our trust in this mighty God who forgives. And hopefully we need to visit 1 John 1:9 less and less as we mature in the Lord. But if you need it, hallelujah, it's there. And if you, you, you may say, you know, I know God's forgiven me, but I'm still struggling with these thoughts. Man, talk to somebody. We need one another. It's important. Elke dag zit u met zoveel vragen. Iedereen zoekt naar antwoorden. Persoonlijke antwoorden die ons kunnen sterken in ons geloof. Die antwoorden liggen soms voor het grijpen. Bereid u voor op Gods woorden die door de Bijbel tot u spreken. En vind de antwoorden met Bayless Conley. I'm Bayless Conley. Welcome to the Answers broadcast. We don't call it answers because we think we know everything, but we know where we can find answers to our questions, and that is in the Bible. And today we're going to be dealing with five confessions that God wants to hear. Call it true confessions. And one, just, just a, a question to think about. Why do I need to confess my sins to God if he's already forgiven them through Christ? Let's talk about that. Aan het einde van de uitzending wil Belis nog een inspirerende gedachte met u delen. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about something that is of life and death importance. I want to talk to you a little bit about words. Proverbs 18, 21, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. In the book of James, it declares that by our words, we can bring blessing or curses into our lives and the lives of others. And he goes on to say that our tongue is like a, a rudder on a ship, determining the direction that our lives will take. Jesus himself said, that we will stand in judgment for every idle word that we have spoken. He said, for by your words you'll be justified, by your words you will be condemned. And in particular, in this short message, I want to share with you five confessions that God wants to hear. Five confessions that God wants to hear. Confession number one is the confession resulting in salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, says that if you confess, everyone say confess, yes. that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto or resulting in salvation. I want you to notice, it is the confession of the Lordship of Christ that results in salvation, not the confession of sin. If an unsaved person had to confess all of their sins in order to be saved, no one would be saved. There's too many to remember. I certainly can't remember everything I have done wrong. Now, yes, we need to recognize that we're sinners and turn from that sin and turn to Christ. I mean, according to Mark, one of the first messages Jesus ever preached was repent, turn, and believe in the gospel. But we need to understand that it's the confession of the lordship of Jesus Christ that results in salvation. The heart and the mouth must come together in this. For with the heart, one believes on the right standing with God, and with the mouth, confession is made, resulting in salvation. Now, you can have the mouth without the heart, and it will do you no good. And a lot of people just sort of parrot things, and they say things, and there's no heart behind it, and there's no results. On the other hand, you can't just have a heart without the lips. He said, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. The heart and the lips must come together. I know I've talked with many, many people in the last four decades, just personally, one-on-one -on -one about Christ, 
share my testimony, share the word of God with them. And I'll say to some people, you believe Jesus is the son of God? And they say, well, yeah, I reckon I do. You believe he was raised from the dead? Well, yes, I, I, I do believe he was raised from the dead. You believe that, that Jesus is the Lord and the author of salvation? Yes, I do. Well, are you willing to confess him as Lord, to die to your rights of independent living and make him the Lord of your life? Well, no, I'm not ready to do that. Now, they do believe in their heart that he's been raised from the dead. They do believe he's the son of God, but they're not willing to make that confession that you have to put the two together to be saved. Other people, you know, when I, I say that to them, well, you know, you're about halfway there. You believe in your heart. Are you ready to confess him as Lord? And some, have, in fact, many have said yes. And I can't tell you how many times I've taken someone's hand, whether it's been on a plane, at a ball field, in a golf course, in a restaurant, outside of the, the plaza, right here on our campus, and prayed a prayer with people of confessing the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And according to God's word, that confession results in salvation. And of course, Lord does mean boss. It means I submit my life to his authority. And we've shared this many times, but if you go back to the beginning in the book of Genesis, God made man in his own image, gave him dominion over everything except one thing. God said, I decide what's right and wrong, what's sin and what's not. I have to be the final authority on this. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, you can't partake of that, Adam. Anything else, it's all yours. Well, Adam decided, Eve decided they wanted to be like God, deciding for themselves what was good, what was evil, what was right, what was wrong. And God said that you ever make that choice, that day you'll die. And of course, they did die spiritually. They were cut off from God. And according to Romans 5 and 12, that Adam, being the fountainhead of the human race, plunged the whole human race. He brought sin into the world and death or separation from God because of that sin, for we all followed him and we have sinned ourselves. But you know, according to 1 Corinthians 4, 15, 45, Jesus is called the last Adam. He came to fix what the first Adam had broken. He came to undo what the first Adam had messed up. And tonight, God sees the whole world. He sees everyone in this room, everyone listening to me, everyone on the planet. God sees them in one of two families, either in Adam or in Christ. There's no, no other categories from God's vantage point. The whole world is in one of two families, in Adam or in Christ. And the scripture says, in Adam, all die, but in Christ, all shall be made alive. The question is, how do you get out of Adam into Christ? We just read it. You believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess him with your mouth as Lord. Literally, you're bowing to his authority. You're stepping under his authority, and the heart must agree with it. That confession results in salvation. Now, somebody says, well, then once I get in Christ, does that mean I, I'll never sin again? Well, that brings us to the second confession. Second confession that God wants to hear is the confession of sin by the believer to God. The confession of sin by the believer to God. Look with me at 1 John, if you would. 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. 1 John 1 and 5 it says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, if we say we have fellowship and we walk in darkness, now the word walk denotes a lifestyle. It, de it, it denotes habitual living. It's not talking about a one-off sin or occasionally messing up, but the person who lives habitually in a sinful lifestyle, and they say they have fellowship with God, the scripture says they are lying, that it's not true. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light, 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship. Notice both of these verses are talking about fellowship. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. All right, how does that happen? How does his blood cleanse us from sin? We look in verse 9, gives us the answer. If we confess, everyone say confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The unsaved person cannot confess all of their sins because they are so many. The believer can confess all of their sins because they are so few. Confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Look in chapter two, verse one. He said, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus pleads our case before the Father in heaven when we confess our sin. He is our advocate. And I want you to notice, John didn't say, look, if you guys mess up, you have an advocate. He said, no, we have an advocate. The great apostle John put himself in the same category of needing to partake of this advocacy ministry of Jesus Christ because he messed up sometimes as well. Now it says that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. He's not just faithful to do it, but he's just. He's right in doing so. Why is he right in doing it? Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. You do not lose your standing as a family member if you sin as a believer. What you do is you break your fellowship with the Father. And when I sin, I don't get saved all over again. I don't lose my salvation. I lose my fellowship, my sense of rightness with God. Remember, these verses are talking about fellowship. We say we have fellowship and we walk in the dark. Fellowship is broken with God when we sin. And the only way that is restored is through the confession of that sin. And you know, usually when the believer sins, the devil loves to assail that believer's mind with condemnation. Revelation 12 and 10 calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. But once we confess our sin to God, we need to accept our forgiveness and our cleansing and not wallow in condemnation. We need to go on and believe that he has forgiven us and that he has cleansed us. Not, well, okay, I got to toe the line for the next week. And if I can do it right for the next week, then I'll start feeling good about myself again. No, friend, it's not about your works. It's about his grace that forgiveness comes. And we need to trust him for that, just like for everything else. Now, let me tell you, you know, 1 John 1, 9 is not some magic wand. And I know some people think, oh, this is great. I can do whatever I want. I'll sleep with her and I'll sleep with him. And I'll, I'll do this because I've got this magic eraser. And it just will make everything right. No, my friend, God sees the heart. And repentance and confession must be genuine. It has to come from the heart. But if you have confessed your sin, God has forgiven you, and you need to forgive yourself and go on. His forgiveness is so complete, it is astonishing. You know, I love the book of Job in the Bible. You read the beginning of the book, and it says, Satan smote Job with boils, and Satan was the one that caused all of the things that happened. Job didn't know that. He couldn't turn to Job chapter 1 and chapter 2 and find out. <laughs> and Job got angry through the story. And he's got some friends and he said, no, you're, you're not my friends, you're miserable comforters. Because they came and they began to accuse Job. Said, well, God's doing all this to you, Job. God's killed your children. God's taken away all your wealth. God has made you sick because you're an evil man. You've turned orphans away. You, you've done this. And, and they accused him of all sorts of things that Job never did. And they said, God's punishing you because you're wicked. And Job got an attitude as you read through. He begins to challenge God. He says, God, you're wrong. 
you're doing this to me, but you're wrong. And if I could find you, I'd bring you before me and I'd lay my case out and you would yield to me because you are wrong. You are unjust and you are cruel. And you read it and Job accuses God of all sorts of things. And at the end of the book, guess who shows up on the scene? God. God sets the record straight and he looks at Job and says, Job, you multiply words without knowledge. You darken counsel without knowledge. You're gonna challenge me? You're gonna correct the Almighty? All right, answer this and answer this. And Job said, I lay my hand on my mouth and I won't say another word. And then you read in chapter 42 and verse six, Job said, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. The very next verse, the Lord's anger is aroused against Job's friends. And they said, God said to them, you have not spoken to me that which is right as my servant Job has. And you read that, God had just got through telling Job that everything he said was wrong. All the accusations that he made were wrong, 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 wrong. And now God says to Job's friends, you haven't spoken to me that which is right like my servant Job. Like God, what's up? You just got through telling him what he said was wrong. <laughs> now what happened? Job repented. Yeah. And from that moment, there was no more record of it. And the ledgers of heaven or in God's mind, as far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. And my friend, when you confess your sin before God, it is gone. Amen. And we need to put our trust in this mighty God who forgives. And hopefully... We need to visit 1 John 1, 9 less and less as we mature in the Lord. But if you need it, hallelujah, it's there. <laughs> All right, confession number three. This is the confession of sin to one another. James chapter five, look there with me if you would, James the fifth chapter. And we wanna look in verse 16, James 5 and 16. It says, confess. Everyone say confess. Yes. Confess your trespasses, that is your sins, your faults, to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, the previous confession of sin to God is implied here. When we sin, we confess our sins to him. But as we see in this verse, in some cases it may be appropriate to confess to others as well. And it's not saying that we need to have someone that acts as a priest, that we go and confess our sins to the priest and the priest goes to God. No, we already read in 1 John 2 and 1 that that is the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's the one that goes to God on our behalf and pleads with God on our behalf. We don't need to go through a man. We all have access to the heavenly father ourselves because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Why and when then might it be advantageous to confess our sins to one another? First, it may be appropriate to confess to the person that you have wronged or hurt. It takes humility to do so, and it is important to do it if we're going to maintain healthy relationships and unity within the church, within the body. I think very few people understand how much healing, restorative power are in the words, I am sorry. And if you've wronged someone, if you've hurt someone, it is right to go to them and yes, you've confessed it to God, you've gotten clean that way, but you need to go confess it to that person. It's amazing when you humble yourself and do that, how it breathes life into relationships. A second reason it can be important is for accountability purposes. If you're struggling in a particular area, confess to someone that you trust. 
somebody that's not gonna put your business out on the street. Someone that can help you and hold you accountable and call you up or have a coffee, say, look, how are you doing with that? You're still having an issue with that. Let, let's pray. Let's go to the Word together. Accountability is a good thing. And if there is an issue that you struggle with, it can be a very, very important thing to confess that to someone else that can hold you accountable and that can hold you up in prayer and strengthen you. And thirdly, it can help unburden our soul and remove a barrier to answered prayer. Notice this verse again, verse 16. It's interesting. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And the, the inference is that when we don't confess sins to others that we should, it, it becomes a barrier to effective prayer. It can become a barrier to receiving healing because the fact is sometimes we just need a friend who will listen to us without judging us, who can then pray with us. I remember a lady that was in our church years ago. Her husband didn't come, wasn't interested in church or in, in the Lord at all. And she'd been trying for a long time, she and her husband, to get pregnant, and she, she was barren. She, she couldn't conceive. And I remember service one day. It was a group of ladies with her, and they were praying for her and praying for her to get pregnant. And all of a sudden, she burst into tears and she confided in these ladies this, this sin that she had committed that was just plaguing her. Now she confessed it to God, but somehow the devil had just managed to condemn her and this condemnation was just kind of you know, on her like an octopus or something. And the devil's always whispering in her ear, you can't go to God, you can't be blessed. Remember what you did, remember what you did. And so with these ladies, she burst into tears. She began to sob and they had a quiet little meeting and she confessed. She said, I, I've confessed it to God, but I did this all these years ago and it has haunted me for years. And a few of those ladies in their wisdom comforted her, shared the word with her. You know that God is not just faithful, but he's also just to forgive us when we confess our sin. And how that Jesus said, hey, you know, not seven times, but 70 times, seven you need to forgive. Is he going to ask us to do something that God wouldn't do? And they, they ministered to her. And somehow it, it broke that condemnation off of her. And they prayed. She went home that day. As far as we can tell, she got pregnant that night. <laughs> she got pregnant. Guess who rocks up to church with her as soon as it was discovered she was pregnant? Her husband comes to church. He says, all right, something happened, and I want to know what, what's going on. There's something real here. He gives his life to Christ and had faithfully served God. In fact, I ran into this lady. I hadn't seen her in years. I ran into her the other day in the market. You know what? Confess your trespasses to one another that you may be healed. For the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And if you, you, you may say, you know, I know God's forgiven me, but I'm still struggling with these thoughts. Man, talk to somebody. We need one another. It's important. Well, I hope you got something out of that, friend. And hey, you're just going to have to join us next week to find out the rest of what those true confessions are. And I just wanna encourage you, if you've never opened your heart to Jesus, why not? Why not do it today? Why put off the most important thing you could ever do with your life, making Jesus Christ Lord? Call on him today, you won't be disappointed. Now I'll be back in a moment with a closing thought and you're not gonna to wanna to miss it. See you in a moment. Heeft u genoten van deze boodschap? Bestel dan de volledige preek op cd of dvd. De contactgegevens staan nu in beeld. We bidden dat u blijft groeien in wijsheid, geloof en de kracht door Gods woord. Hier is Belis met een inspirerende gedachte die u vandaag al kunt toepassen. God does not want you, nor does he want me 
to be enslaved by sin. Jesus Christ came to deliver us from sin. He died for our sins. The scripture says in the book of Romans that sin shall not have dominion over us. So I guess the question is, if, if you know, sin doesn't have dominion over us, if Jesus broken the power of it, you know, why do we find ourselves entangled sometimes with these familiar sins? Well, you know, there's a process that Jesus talked about, and we need to be engaged, exercise our will, call upon God for his help. But it starts in the mind. You know, Jesus said, hey, if your eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it from you. Now, he's not talking about physically, you know, pulling out your eye and throwing it away, but he's talking about self-judgment, deal with it. And the eye represents the thought. When, when it comes as a thought, deal with it quickly. And then he went on in, a, in another place, said, well, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. Again, self-judgment. Now, the hand represents, represents an occasional act. You know, you reach out and you do something that you shouldn't have done. And then he said in another place, if your foot causes you to uh, offend and to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. The foot represents a walk. It, it represents an entrenched lifestyle. Begins with a thought, moves to an occasional act, and if not dealt with, it moves to an entrenched lifestyle. The key, my friend, is dealing with it in the thought realm. Call on God for help. Replace those wicked thoughts with the Word of God, and you'll find yourself succeeding over the battle with sin. Volgende week bij Antwoorden met Belis Conley. Regardless of what's going on, regardless of how bad it looks, regardless of how the deck seems to be stacked against you, I will never leave you or forsake you so that we can boldly say, what am I going to do? God, where are you? This isn't working out. You're not hearing my prayers. No. So that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear. What can man do to me? I confess my confidence in his promise. Why? Because he is faithful. Hi there. I have a resource entitled Footprints of Faith that I believe will be a blessing to you. There's a book included in it as well as several teachings on CD. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God and I'm going to tell you without faith it's impossible to walk with God. This resource is going to help you in your daily journey with the Lord. Footprints of Faith. Leer hoe je Gods leiding kunt herkennen en volgen. En zie hoe zijn kracht zijn werk doet in jouw leven. In dit boekje en deze drie overdenkingen leer je wat de zegeningen zijn. Als je in geloof je ene voet voor de andere zet. Ook als je nog niet ziet waar het naartoe leidt. Bestel vandaag nog deze set. De contactgegevens staan nu in beeld. Voetsporen van het geloof.